The opening section of Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason is called the Transcendental Aesthetic. It is the first part of the Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. In it, Kant examines the concepts of space and time, challenging the traditional notion that they are objective features of the world. Instead, Kant argues that space and time are forms of human intuition. They are structures through which we perceive and organise sensory data into rational experience. Through this exploration, Kant seeks to illuminate the conditions that make human knowledge possible and thus lay the foundation for his broader critical philosophy which takes place in the subsequent sections. We now proceed with a simplified abridgment of the text. Intuition is the means by which cognition relates to objects, and sensibility is the capacity to form mental representations based on how we are affected by those objects. We know appearances a posteriori through sensible intuition, but the pure form of sensible intuition already exists in the mind a priori, where it is a pure intuition. This pure intuition is a form of sensibility in the mind. The transcendental aesthetic is the science of all principles of a priori sensibility. In the transcendental aesthetic, we focus on sensibility by excluding the conceptual aspect of understanding, leaving only sensible or empirical intuition. From this, we detach everything related to sensation, leaving only pure intuition and the basic form of appearances, which is available a priori. By doing this, we find that space and time are two pure forms of sensible intuition and are thus a priori principles of our cognition. We shall now examine both of these principles further. Section 1. On Space Our outer sense represents objects outside of us in space, while our inner sense intuits our inner state, and represents all inner experiences in terms of relations of time. Space is not an empirical concept drawn from experience, but an a priori representation that necessarily grounds outer appearances. That is, space is a necessary condition of the possibility of appearances, and is the ground of all outer perceptions. Space is not a general concept, but a pure intuition. It is a single and unique entity that is represented as an infinite given magnitude, and so it cannot be reduced to a mere concept. Space is a principle from which synthetic a priori knowledge can be gained. For instance, geometry determines the properties of space synthetically and a priori. The representation of space for such a cognition must originally be an intuition that is pure and not empirical. Outer intuition inhabits the mind as the framework for being affected by objects and acquiring immediate representation. Understanding this role of outer intuition allows us to grasp how geometry can be a form of synthetic a priori knowledge. In conclusion, space is not a property or relation of things in themselves, but rather a subjective condition of sensibility that is necessary for outer intuition. It is a pure intuition, containing principles of how objects relate to each other prior to experience. Space is only applicable from the human standpoint, and signifies nothing without the subjective condition of sensibility. It encompasses all things that may appear to us externally, but not all things in themselves. Space has empirical reality with respect to all possible outer experience, but is transcendental in that it is nothing beyond the condition of the possibility of all experience. Apart from space, there are no other subjective representations related to something external that can be called a priori objective. Sensations of colour, sound, and heat belong only to the subjective constitution of sense, 
and do not allow any object to be cognized. Colors and tastes are alterations of the subject, not qualities of things. Again, absolutely nothing that is intuited in space is a thing in itself, and objects in themselves are not known to us at all. Outer objects are mere representations of our sensibility, whose form is space, but the thing in itself cannot be cognized through these representations. Section 2. On Time Like space, time is not derived from experience, but is a necessary representation that underlies all our intuitions. The principles of time are based on its a priori necessity, guiding us before any actual experiences occur. Different times are only parts of the same single time, and the proposition that different times cannot be simultaneous is immediately evident in our intuition of time. The infinite nature of time means that every determinate duration of time is only possible through limitations of the single time that grounds it. Therefore, time must be understood as unlimited through our immediate intuition. The concepts of change and motion rely on the representation of time as an a priori intuition. Without this representation, no concept could explain the possibility of a combination of contradictory characteristics in one object. Time enables us to encounter contradictory determinations successively, explaining the possibility of synthetic a priori cognition in the general theory of motion. In conclusion, time is the subjective condition that allows for all intuitions to take place within us. It is the form of inner intuition, and is the a priori formal condition of all appearances in general. Time is not a determination of outer appearances, and cannot be represented through them. All appearances, whether inner or outer, are necessarily in time, and stand in relations of time. Time is a subjective condition of human intuition, and is not an objective property of things in themselves. It is only objectively valid in regard to appearances and objects of sensible intuition. Time is transcendentally ideal, meaning that it has no existence outside of our subjective conditions of sensible intuition. Insightful philosophers have objected to the theory that time is only empirically real, and not absolutely or transcendentally real. Their objection is that change is real, and since changes are only possible in time, time must be something real. This argument is valid, and time is indeed real as the form of inner intuition, possessing subjective reality in the context of inner experience. Time does not adhere to objects, but only to the subject that intuits them. However, the objection to the ideality of space is based on a misunderstanding. Both outer objects and the object of inner sense are representations that belong only to appearance, with the form of intuition belonging to the subject that intuits them. Time and space are sources of cognition that allow for synthetic a priori propositions, such as in pure mathematics. However, these sources of cognition only apply to objects as appearances and do not present things in themselves. Those who assert the absolute reality of space and time conflict with the principles of experience. The transcendental aesthetic only contains space and time as a priori data, as all other concepts belonging to sensibility are empirical. The perception of motion, as well as the succession of its determinations, requires experience, and cannot be a priori data. Our intuition is the representation of appearance, and the things we intuit are not, in themselves, what we intuit them to be. The subjective constitution of the senses in general is necessary for the constitution and relations of objects in space and time to exist. We can only know our way of perceiving objects, and are not acquainted with objects abstracted from our sensibility. 
space and time serve as the fundamental structures of our cognition, while sensation, in general, provides the content. The difference between an indistinct and a distinct representation is merely logical and does not concern the content. The representation of a body in intuition contains nothing that could pertain to an object in itself, but merely the appearance of something, and the way in which we are affected by it. This receptivity of our cognitive capacity is called sensibility, and remains worlds apart from the cognition of the object in itself. Through sensibility, we do not merely cognize the constitution of things in themselves indistinctly. Rather, we do not cognize them at all. The represented object is nowhere to be encountered without our subjective constitution, which determines its form as appearance. The distinction between appearance and object is empirical, but it is lost if we believe that we can cognize things in themselves. Even empirical objects are mere appearances without our subjective constitution, and the transcendental object remains unknown to us. The transcendental aesthetic must be certain and indubitable, and a particular case can be explained to make this certainty obvious. If space and time were objective conditions for things in themselves, then there would be a large number of synthetic propositions about them that cannot be derived from empirical concepts or intuitions. Yet the only way to attain such propositions is through a priori concepts or intuitions. In natural theology, removing the conditions of space and time from the intuition of an object that cannot be intuited is problematic. If time and space are considered forms of things in themselves, they must also be conditions of the existence of God. However, if they are not objective features, they must be subjective forms of human intuition, which is dependent on the existence of the object. While sensibility in space and time may be universal, it is not an original intellectual intuition which pertains to the original being. In conclusion, pure a priori intuitions, namely space and time, are necessary for the solution to the problem of how synthetic a priori propositions are possible in transcendental philosophy. These intuitions allow us to go beyond given concepts and connect them with a priori knowledge that is discovered synthetically in the corresponding intuition. However, such judgments are limited to objects of the senses and not to things in themselves. And that brings us to the end of the Transcendental Aesthetic, being the first part of the Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. In the next part, entitled The Transcendental Logic, Kant will address the use of a priori concepts in metaphysics, and how we apply these categories to our experience. Please subscribe to the channel, with notifications on, to be notified when we post the next section. You can find ways to support the creation of more videos on this channel in the description below. Thank you for listening, and have a good rest of your day.